Welcome, 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 um, everyone, to the Queen Call. We are super excited about tonight's call um, here at Queens and Sun. As you know, Queens and Sun Incorporated, we're in a women's empowerment organization, and we have a Queen Call every Thursday, every last Thursday of each and every month. Um, but before we get started with tonight's call, we would like to just go ahead and open up in prayer, and you can pray in the manner in which you are accustomed to. Heavenly Father, we thank you, thank you, thank you for your divine mercy and love for allowing us this opportunity to be present on this call tonight. We ask that you open the hearts and minds of everyone on this, um, who are present tonight on this call to receive a word that will inspire and uplift them to do your work. We ask that you please uh, bless us with more inspiration, with guidance, um, that we walk, that we go away from this call with more knowledge, but not just more knowledge, but that you give us a spirit and the zeal and the desire to actually apply the knowledge that we learn, that we may grow into oneness with you. We are very thankful and grateful for your divine love and mercy, for seeing fit that we are, such, or that we are among such a great group of women and that we have the opportunity to grow, that we may be of better service to you. Uh, we are just Thankful, thankful, thankful to you, Father God, for this opportunity. We don't take it for granted. I mean, okay. Now with that being said, um, once again, welcome to all of those who have dialed in for the first time, and welcome to those who have dialed in several times. Um, We don't take your time for granted. Um, As you know, uh, Queendom Com, we started the Queen Cause as a means to share and transfer knowledge to the sisterhood. Um, It really is a time that we just decided that we need to, hey, we tend to everybody else. We care for our husbands, our children. We're taking care of, uh, we're busy with work things. We're busy in the church. We're busy with taking care of others. But this is a time, a sacred time, that we use to invest in ourselves. Um, And even at this very moment, we still may be doing other things for other people. But this is just a time where we stop and try to invest something of ourselves, I mean something into ourselves. And the best way that we can uplift one another is by the sharing of information, the sharing of knowledge. Um, So that is what the Queen Calls are designed for, is for us as a sisterhood to share with one another that we may grow. Um, And with that being said, we have had such uh, tremendous success. We've had an all-star lineup. Each and every month, we have just some of the best minds on the calls, and um, they have been so inspiring and so uplifting and very, very um, profound. And we're going to continue that tradition tonight with our wonderful sister that we have for you this evening. Um, in tomorrow, I'm sorry, in our queen, Tamara Winfrey Harris. And let me just say how we became aware of this very beautiful sister. Um, I have not met her personally, but I feel connected to her already. Um, And I came to the knowledge of her through Facebook. Um, It it was a list on Facebook of the top ten books that every black woman should possess. And, of course, her book was on there, which is entitled – the Sisters Are All Right, Recreating the Narrative for Black Women. And just the title alone caught my attention. So as I'm looking through this list of books, and, of course, I come to hers, I was stopped in my track because, like I said, the title alone caught my attention because at Kingdom Come, this is exactly what we're trying to do. We are trying to recreate the narrative of black, black women by giving them the tools necessary to find, not only find their purpose, but do it on purpose and then live in that purpose, thereby creating their own destiny. And so, just like I said, the title alone was very eye-catching. But then to go a step further, I read the preface of her book. And within the first paragraph, I knew that I would purchase this book um, because it was, she spoke my deepest thoughts, my sentiments, my heartfelt sentiments of how I feel about, about black women And it was just so gripping to me because it's like she uh, expressed what was in my heart, what was in my mind. And the first sentence of her preface is, I love black women. 
And as you read the presence alone, not to mention the rest of the book, but just the presence alone, you feel the love coming from this sister. You feel her compassion. She is such a profound writer. I mean, she just writes so beautifully. I feel like she speaks for me. Um, I feel like she is a champion for black women in the way that she expresses herself through her writing. You just feel the honesty, the sincerity, the boldness. Um, I love it. It's, she speaks straight words, um, and she does it with compassion. She does it with love. She does it with truth. She does it with honesty. And I am very excited about this call tonight. And I don't want to go on and on because I could go on and on and on about <laughs> her work. But we're going to allow our sister Waikiti to read a little bit about her and um, get started with the call. Sister Waikiti, are you on? Yes, I am. How are you all? Wonderful. Yeah. Well, I am very, very, very excited, Mrs. Harris. I am elated to finally meet you. We have been talking about you, honestly, for months and months since Sister Oshia first found out about the book. And so we are uh, very, very excited to have you all, and it is an honor. I want to go ahead and read a little bit, just a very brief um, summary of Mrs. Harris's um, work in her bio, but I know for a fact that her body of work speaks for itself. But we just want to reintroduce some of you to her. Tamara Winfrey Harris is a writer who specializes in the ever-evolving space where current events, politics, and pop culture intersect with race and gender. Her first book is The Sisters Are All Right. Changing the Broken Narrative for Black Women in America. And for black women, Tamara explains, the most radical thing we can do is to throw off the shackles forged by stereotypes and regain our full and complete com uh, complex humanity. This is a revolutionary act in the face of society, eager to mold us into hard, unbreakable things. And we just want to stop right there just for a moment that entire idea of us being hard and molded into unbreakable things. I love the way she phrases that. I love all of her work that I've been blessed to come in contact with thus far. Sister Tamara, and this queen has been um, spoken about in various media outlets, such as the New York Times, the Weekend Edition, the Daily Circuit, the American Prospect, the Salon, the Guardian, we're very familiar with, the Huffington Post, Newsweek Daily, and we can go on and go on and on and on, even referenced by New York Magazine. She had an initial blog. Her first personal blog was called What Tammy Said, and, of course, that led to several award-winning um, repeats and quotes from different people, including the New York Magazine. And one of those wonderful rewrites that were posted from her blog was an article entitled Nappy Love, or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Embrace the King. Without further ado, we would love to welcome Queen Tamara Winfrey Harris. Oh, my goodness. That is such an amazing introduction. I feel so, so welcomed, and I'm honored to be here with all of you this evening. But I have three, three words for you, and they are strong black woman. I'm going to say that again, strong black woman. I know you've heard those words together probably a million times. They seem like they fit together like blue magic, hot combs, and Sunday afternoon, right? Because in the popular consciousness, black women, we are the fighters and the women who don't take stuff from no man. We are the sassy women with the sharp tongues and the hands firmly on our hips. We are the ride or die chicks. We are the women who, like Sojourner Truth said, plowed and planted and gathered into barns. And she added, 
and no man could head me. We are the mothers who make a way out of no way. And on TV, we are often the no-nonsense police chiefs and judges. We are the first ladies with the impressive biceps. But there is a dirty side to the idea that black women are uncommonly strong. The myth of the strong black woman can actually be at odds with our very survival. For one, too many people think that our strength makes black women indestructible, as we said at the beginning of the call. You know, that's the truth behind the violent treatment of Sandra Bland by a Texas police officer. But the pressure to be strong also means that many of us dare not give in to our vulnerability even as we're breaking emotionally and physically. And that is leaving black women in a bad way. Luckily, there is a solution, and it lies with every woman on this call. Self-care and sisterhood can save our lives. Self-care and sisterhood can save our lives. So last year, my first book was published. It's called The Sisters Are All Right, Changing the Broken Narrative of Black Women in America. And it's about the reality behind stereotypes about black women. It's about how we really live versus the stories people tell about us. Now, I interviewed more than 100 black women for sisters, and I've met probably a hundred, hundreds more traveling around the country in support of it. And I'm here to tell you one thing they say is true, and that thing is you cannot outdo us. I am continually amazed at what black women can achieve. I mean, just look, look at what black women have done in the last year. Serena Williams is the best athlete of all time, hands down. Alicia Garza, Patrice Cullors, and Opal Tometi. Those are black women founded Black Lives Matter. That means it is black women leading the modern day civil rights movement. That's huge. And for all the scandal fans and how to get away with murder fans on the call, you know Shonda Rhimes owns Thursday nights on ABC. And Michelle Obama. That's all I need to say, right? Michelle Obama. She needs no introduction. And let me point out, it is extra hard to be great as a black woman in a society that is still both sexist and racist Forget twice as good. We have to be three times as good. And many of the women that I talked to for sisters said that they find truth and liberation and empowerment in the idea of strong black womanhood. So they said they're inspired by the idea that black women are uniquely resilient, in part you know, that's, that's how some of us get the strength to do what we do. So they liked the idea that, you know, like Timex, we take a licking and keep on ticking. And like that Donnie McClurkin gospel song, we fall down and what? We get up. Fatima Thomas, she's a Ph.D. candidate living in the Midwest, and she told me, this is a quote, from Fatima. Even at our lowest point, black women are survivors. It's the small things for me that add up to who I am. Something as simple as getting out of bed when I'd rather ball up and cry for days. The fact that I can do that, the fact that with much less than I have, women who came before me and have this skin in common with me just kept getting up. As much as I want to just be, 
I actually am far stronger than most. And she said, I love that about us. And I love that about us too. But let me introduce you to another woman that I met through my journey writing sisters. Her name is Deborah. Deborah is the mother of three boys. She divorced when they were young, and so she raised them to adulthood on her own. She is an educator, she is a writer, and she has always been an activist in her community. But one day, when she was 40 years old, Deborah had an anxiety attack. She said it felt like dying. Her heart was pounding so hard, she just knew she was having a heart attack. You know, that day she found herself sitting in the office of a therapist who suggested that she get also a complete physical. And they found a bunch of stuff. She was so anemic, in fact, that she fainted outside of the clinic. And the doctors discovered something else, too. She had uterine fibroid tumors. She had known that something was wrong for a while. In fact, fibroids ran in her family. But she had been ignoring signs that her mental and physical health were fragile because she was busy and because people needed her and because she had to be strong. It took therapy, a hysterectomy, and four months for Deborah to heal, and that gave her time to question how she became so sick. She said the answer, in part, was that she had become, as Zora Neale Hurston wrote of black women, and their eyes were watching God, the mule of the world, taking on everyone's burdens to her own detriment. And it took skidding like that health-wise for her to realize that she is not invincible. And you know, that's a really hard lesson to learn within a culture that wants most for black women to always be self-sacrificing. Deborah said this, and I think it's true. This is a quote. We are taught to take care of everybody else. We are always giving our strength away. You know what I'm saying? We're strong for our children. We're strong on the job. We're strong for our husbands. We're strong if we're in church. It's always an outpouring. We're never allowed to say, hey, I'm really tired. Hey, I'm hurting. I'm exhausted. You're exhausting me. I need a break. I don't want to do anything for anybody. We're just geared to give. So good news, 20 years later, Deborah is happy to have survived her wake-up call. But the sad thing is that for several of her friends, the call never came. She told me, Deborah told me, that she has lost three friends, strong black women all, who ended up not reading their own health signals. Now this is tragic. She told me she had a friend who had 2,000 hours of sick time, 2,000 hours of sick time, and who was doubled over in chronic pain, but constantly said, I can't take off from work. When she finally went to the doctor, because it got to the point where the pain couldn't be managed anymore, she discovered that she had terminal cancer. She was dying. You know, many of us believe that if we aren't there at home, at church, in our community groups, at work, that everything is just going to fall apart. Deborah says, I don't believe that anymore. It's not healthy. But the thing is, Deborah's story is not unique. I bet many of you can share similar ones of black women you know who are suffering physically and mentally from being strong. The story may even be your own. Let me share some statistics with you. One in four black women over 50 have diabetes. 
Heart disease is more prevalent among black women than white women. 37% of black women have high blood pressure. We also have a rate of depression 50% higher than that of white women, but only 7% of us with symptoms of mental illness seek treatment. You see, we are strong, but we are not unbreakable. You know, many of these ills, the ones that I just mentioned, are lifestyle diseases that may be prevented by self-care. But the expectation that we live up to the strong black woman myth means that too often we fail to show compassion for ourselves. You know, I hate to bring this wonderful gathering of women down, but we need to get real. Black women are all kinds of resilient and amazing, but being strong all the time is killing us. But I told you there was a solution, and there is. It's May. It is, yes, it's May. And it's, but it's never too late to make a resolution. So I want you, everyone on this call, to resolve this year and every year. I want you to pledge to do two things. First thing is take care of yourself first. Take care of yourself first. Black women take the lead in so many things. We are vital and important parts of our communities. But you can't lead anyone if you are broken down. Okay, this is a bit of a cliche, but I'm going to use it because it works. So you know how when you take a flight and in the safety demonstration, they tell you um, in case of a loss of cabin pressure, an oxygen mask is going to drop down, and they tell you to do what first? They tell you to put the mask on yourself. Because you can't save others if you don't save yourself. That isn't selfish. That's practical. Deborah told me that while she was recovering, she spent time doing more of the things that she loves to do, including reading and watching movies. She started treating herself to what she called Queen Esther days, all about pampering. She started taking naps. And she learned how to say no. I want you all to promise me today that you will never sacrifice your health and well-being for anyone or anything. You are too valuable. I want you to pay attention to your bodies and your minds. I want you to promise that you will proactively care for yourself. That means you will see your doctor and you will see your therapist and you will take your medicine and you will find your version of a Queen Esther day. Spend some time doing what makes you happy, whether that's you read, you can take a walk, spend time with your family. You can look at pictures of Idris Elba online. But just don't wait until it's too late. So, okay, the second thing. I need you to resolve to support your sisters, support your sisters. You know, when you're around a group of high-achieving, high-functioning women, like the ones on this call, it is easy to think that they can handle everything. I bet a lot of you make everything you do look effortless. And then we get so used to black women being marginalized and disrespected that we just expect for attacks to just roll off a sister's back. Remember the woman I mentioned earlier, Fatima Thomas? Well, she said to me, quote, when you've been strong for so long, even when you do break down and someone is there and you're on the floor saying, somebody help me, they'll be like, oh, girl, get up. You got this. No, I don't. That's why I'm on the floor. I don't got this. I want each of you to commit to being a source of support for your sisters. 
recognize when they need help and are maybe afraid to ask, stop sometimes and say, you all right, sis? Now, I want this message to get into your spirit. So usually at this point in my presentation, I borrow a little from the church. So if I were in front of you right now, I would tell you to look at your neighbor. But since we can't see each other, I'll just say I want you to repeat after me, and I want you to say, take care of you. Take care of you. And then I want you to say, sis, I got you. Sis, I got you. I am asking you today to take care of yourselves and to take care of each other. Writing The Sisters Are All Right made me feel so joyful about black women. You're talking to other women about how beauty, about you know, beauty and motherhood and health and strength and anger, and yes, sex was affirming. You know, we really are all right. But, understanding the ways that we are undone by the need to be strong, even me, made me sad because I love me some us. Like I said at the beginning of my book, at the preface, I said I love black women. I love the Baptist church mothers in white. I love the YouTube twerkers. I love the sisters with the Ivy League degrees and the ones with the GEDs. I love the big mamas, the mud deers, the aunties. I love the lock-wearing sisters who smell like shea butter. I love the ladies of the Divine Nine. I love the bad sisters and designer pumps and premium lace fronts. I love the girls who jumped double dutch and played hopscotch. I love the awkward black girls and the quirky black girls and the black girls who listen to punk. I love the standing on the bus stop, sucking on a lollipop, round the way girls. Black womanhood, with its unique histories and experiences, marks its possessors as something special. You are all special, too special to be lost because you were too strong to say enough or I need to take time for me. As I said in my book, one of the most radical things African-American women can do is to throw off the shackles forged by the strong black woman meme and regain a full and complex humanity that allows us to be capable and strong and independent, but also to be carried and cared for. Allowing for physical and emotional vulnerability is not weakness or selfishness. It is humanness. And for black women, it is revolutionary. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Um, you said a mouthful, um, and I, <laughs> I've taken so many notes um, because I think you hit at a core topic um, about women. I mean, just the black woman, like you said, the strong black woman, that whole narrative that we have that they can't see as quiet, they can't see as weak. Um, mm-hmm. You know, we have this idea in our minds, and we actually live this kind of life, and it absolutely is breaking us down because we're kind of out of balance in a sense. Um, I guess I have really two questions, but the first question Mm -hmm. is, as you stated, I love black women. Um, As Mm -hmm. you know, in our communities, a lot of times um, you talk about the importance of sisterhood, and we know that a hood is a covering for one another. Mm -hmm. Um, A lot of times we have these hindrances or we have a lot of things in a way that stop us from really loving each other. Have you always loved black women, or did you have to work through some things to get to that level? Because, you know, you hear black women say, I don't really fool with too many women, or we have this stigma about other women that stops 
us from embracing one another. Um, how did you come to that point of just that sincere love of other black women? I think I've always had it, thank, thank goodness, and I think that's yeah. part of how my, how my parents raised me. And I think when you hear women say that, it's internalized sexism. Um, and mm-hmm. I know people, you know, there, there's also a stereotype that black women don't get along. And I don't right. think that's true. Some of the most supportive people in my life, some of the most supportive people while I was, you know, writing my book were other black women. Um, mm-hmm. But I also think, you know, and this, this holds true for all marginalized groups, whether you're marginalized by your race or by your gender, you know, being an oppressed group makes, you know, the people in charge makes you feel like this, make you feel this sense of lack, you know. Mm-hmm. It, it feels mm-hmm. like, you know, they pit us against each other and make us think that mm-hmm. we have to fight each other for crumbs. And so I mm-hmm. think that's why, you know, sometimes you get dissension between marginalized people because, you know, it's hard being where we are. But I think mm-hmm. ultimately black women, you know, it, you know, we love each other and, and we support mm-hmm. each other as a whole, as a group. Mm-hmm. I, I agree with that. Um, mm-hmm. And I guess I, I, t- I definitely agree with that. I've always, for the most part, um, not that I've had, I mean, for the most part, I've always got along with women and always loved the company of women, and mm-hmm. um, I just value uh, women in general because they have had so much impact on my life as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do hear that a lot, you know, mm-hmm. about women. Uh, you know, they prefer to be around men because they're not, you know, as petty, I guess. Um, but I think you're right. I think that's just a stereotype. Of course, you're going to have some inward fighting, but I don't think that's the majority. Um, right. I mean, certainly, I mean, certainly you will come across some petty right. women as you will come across yeah. some petty men. Exactly. <laughs> but, but anyone who is ready to write off an entire group of people because of a mm-hmm. stereotype about them, I mean, it, you just have to stop and, and think about that. Right. Right. Um, I guess my next question is about, um, you said the words gear to give. As women, Mm -hmm. we naturally cater to everyone, um, and we often suffer from not taking care of ourselves. I guess, Mm -hmm. you know, as a mother or as a a mother and a wife, someone who works, someone who's involved, um, how do you, it's easier said than done, but the imbalance of our Mm -hmm. lives is, and then, you know, God forbid, you know, we have some single mothers, and it's like as a married woman, mm-hmm. I know that it takes two, and we're still mm-hmm. trapped, you know. And I just, it, mm-hmm. being a, you know, my husband's out of town for a few days, and I'm doing everything by myself, it is just, oh, my goodness. <laughs> so <laughs> much. It's overwhelming. And so I really take my hat off to single moms, you know. It is a lot of work, mm-hmm. especially if you're trying to invest in your children. Um, but how do you, if you don't do it, it's like, who will? And then how do you deal with the guilt if you begin to take time away and then other things don't get done? And so then it's this conflict in your mind as if you feel like you're slacking or no one is going to do it if you don't. How do you balance that in your mind? Well, I think, too, I think, I think there are two issues here, and, mm-hmm. and one is, is – um, there's also a, a, a class and an understanding that black women have all different situations. So what looks right. like self-care for one person is not self-care for another person. So I'll talk about that in a second. But I think um, part of it is, I mean, you said if you don't do it, who will? Right. Well, if you weren't there, somebody would do it, <laughs> you know. And, <laughs> and, I mean, we do. I mean, there, there's nothing wrong with giving. I mean, all mm-hmm. humans should be giving. We, we would hope that all humans are giving and that we all care about each other and we all do things for each other. But the reality is it's not helpful to give until you have nothing left. And that's not mm-hmm. good for your husband. It's not good for your kids. If, mm-hmm. you know, if you, God forbid, die early because you didn't take mm-hmm. care of yourself because you ran yourself into the ground thinking you were helping your children, that doesn't help. It doesn't help. Mm-hmm. And I think very often because as women, all women really, not just black women, we've been told there are certain things that we must do. And I even went through this when I was writing my book. So 
I am not a full-time writer. I have a full-time job. While I was writing mm-hmm. the book, I was also adjunct teaching a class mm-hmm. and trying to write a book and doing a bunch mm-hmm. of other stuff, you know, home and all of those things. And I would just get so overwhelmed. I swear there were, there were some points where I thought I was going to lose it. And, you know, mm-hmm. sometimes I had to stand back and remind myself, you know, I have a whole husband. There's a whole other adult in the house. <laughs> so why was it that I, you know, what I felt like there were some things that I could have easily, had I asked him to do them, he would have gladly done. But you just, for some reason, I felt like it had to be my responsibility. Um, mm-hmm. And then when we're told everything is our responsibility, it's also hard to let go of um, being able to let, let go of the control. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, that there's a plus side to being in charge of everything because you get to control everything. So, you know, if your mm-hmm. husband cleans up the kitchen, maybe it's not exactly <laughs> up to your standards, you know. <laughs> right, but, right. But it's, but it's, but it's done. You know, right, right. so you right. know it's it's learning it's learning to let go of those things. But mm-hmm. to your point, I always I also think we have to realize that self care looks a lot of different ways. So for a mm-hmm. lot of people, you know, we talk about self care. Everyone's mind immediately goes to pedicures, and I'm going to take a day, and I'm just going to for myself, and I'm going to go stay in a hotel room, and that's not the reality. I mean, look at black women and dealing with poverty and, you know, raising children on their own and a lot of things that we, many of us have to do, that may not be a realistic picture of self-care. So Mm -hmm. part of it is, um, part of it as individuals, it's figuring out what we can do, what, what is possible for us in the situation we're in now and how we might be able to use our village um, the people mm-hmm. around us to help us mm-hmm. to just get get a little bit of something for ourselves, but it's not always mm-hmm. easy. I acknowledge that. Mhm, mhm. And when you talk about self care, you are right. A lot of us, because if you go on a on any nail shop or pedicure, I mean, it's full of black women. Uh, we're mm-hmm. at the hair salon. We're getting our pedicures, our manicures. Uh, we are just, you know, living that life. Um, but we're still dying of heart disease. We're still having uh, mm-hmm. overburdened with stress. Um, you know, we still are suffering from obesity and diabetes. Um, mm-hmm. We're still suffering with mental issues. So can, if you don't mind, can you touch on that aspect of, you know, self-care being more than just, you know, the physical aspect, but the mental and spiritual um, aspect as well and getting that cared for as well? Yeah, we can't just, and I think sometimes those things that you talked about are easier. It's so much yeah. easier to stop by the nail salon and get a $15, mm-hmm. you know, get a $15 manicure than right. it is to really sit down with a therapist and work out mm-hmm. your issues, mm-hmm. you know. It is, it's, mm-hmm. you know, it's easier to get a facial than it is. Lord knows I know than to get to the gym after work or just, or just, or just get out and walk around the block. Um, you know, it's, it's easier to go buy that new dress that we really want. But ultimately, you end up kind of, you know, if your, your foundation is crumbling, you have, a, you know, you have this old house with a crumbling foundation and you keep just painting it and making it look pretty and planting flowers out front. I mean, eventually it's going to fall apart. Um, And, you know, that kind of speaks to taking care of our own houses, taking care of our own bodies, taking care of our own minds, and not just painting over things, not just making the outside look pretty, and not just doing the easiest kinds of self-care. Because some kinds of self-care, I mean, it may not feel like self-care at the beginning. It might be something that's hard for a while, but mm-hmm. that it's ultimately good for us. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay, Sister Sadia, you have a question? Yes, ma'am. Sister Tamara, okay, so we're talking about the, the strong black woman disease or the complex mm-hmm. that most of us on this call we have because we're super mm-hmm. achievers. So in, in most of us, um, we're mothers and married at the same time. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And sometimes as married women, we feel like single women uh, or mar- mm-hmm. uh, single women with children. Now, how do, how do we deal with the aspect of our men in our lives in the superwoman complex? Because the thing is, if they fall short, intuitively mm-hmm. we know that we got to take care of the children. And so we go in overdrive, even though mm-hmm. it may be one-sided or we are, the way we think and the way we work are, is, you know, it's so expansive as opposed to a man who's so focused and, you know, he's not worried about the details. And we get caught up in the details, sometimes to our detriment. So how do you deal with, how do we deal as women with the men in our lives with the superwoman complex? Because we feel like if we don't make, if they don't help us, then we still got to keep moving. How how do we handle that? Oh, goodness. (laughs) (laughs) You have to know. Well, first, first I would say, First, I would say, you know, one, one thing that I think we don't talk enough about to young black women, you know, okay, a few years ago, there was this big flurry of discussion about black women in marriage. I know you guys remember it, probably about three years ago. Steve Harvey and all these guys are writing books about, you know, black women are less likely to marry than other women. And so it was all about what black women need to do to, as they say, get chose. So how we need to fix ourselves. But what no one talked about, I had a lot of problems with that discussion. But one of the biggest ones is if you're going to marry and spend your life with someone, it's not about them choosing you. It's about you choosing and you choosing wisely. Um, In her book, Lean In, Sheryl Sandberg, who's the COO of Facebook, um, and she was writing about black women, I mean, sorry, not black women, but women succeeding in corporate America, and she said choosing, choosing your partner is one of the most important choices you will make and will make a difference as to how, how much success you can have because how much of the burden are they willing to shoulder as well and are they willing to be partners. So one thing I think we need to do is to be raising our daughters to choose instead of raising them to be chosen raise them to choose and choose wisely and choose partners um, Mm -hmm. that are good for them and will be partners. But then we know even good men, (laughs) even good (laughs) husbands, we have have been raised, not because we're inherently all that different, we've just been raised differently and to focus (laughs) on different things. So I think part of it is training. And, you know, one thing, Um, A friend of mine told me that her therapist said, and I just thought it was just so profound, was, you know, she said that you can't, you can't overachieve to make up for someone else underachieving. So, you know, if, if someone isn't picking up, you know, we tend to, if someone isn't picking up their side, oh, well, so we're just going to do it all. And that's not fair. You know, we, we need to be able to have frank discussions with our partners and to say, you know, I need you to do X um, instead of just giving up and walking away and saying, well, I'm going to take all the burden because ultimately that's a detriment to ourselves. And it also, I think it, it, it's hard on marriages and relationships <laughs> because you get a little resentful if you have to do everything. And then mm-hmm. there's that other that then there's that other side that I talked about of, of being willing to let go of control. Like I, I know I love my husband and he will he will clean the kitchen. He won't necessarily wipe down the counters and it's just okay. I'm so familiar. We'll just, we'll just keep we'll just keep it moving. It's I mean right. in the scheme of things it's gonna be okay. So, you know, sort of like you said where we get caught up in the details, sometimes we have to just let go of the details because if it means if, you know, it's, if the laundry is done but it's not, this is ideas. I'm here. I'm here. Okay. Do we, it's, do we, it's the Mr. Can you still hear me? Yes. yes it's me. Okay. Oh. I, I was going to say, if, you know, if the laundry is done and it's not done exactly how you would do it, but that means your family can spend time together, 
and you and your husband have time to help the kids with their homework and do some other things that are important, well, then it's okay, you know? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I know, I guess going along with that same concept of um, the strong woman complex, and you said so much, literally I was in tears earlier during your entire presentation, I was bawling, you know, and the tears would not stop falling because it's absolutely true. I've seen my mother do it, you know, Mm -hmm. as she worked her two and three jobs to make sure that she was taking Mm -hmm. care of her children. I think as single women, there's a whole other reality because Mm -hmm. there's no husband there for you Mm -hmm. to rely on. You have to do it by yourself. What Mm -hmm. do you say and how do we as single women give ourselves permission to say that everything may not look um, the way that someone else's house may look. I may not be able to give you a brand new car for your graduation from high school Mm -hmm. or throw you, you know, a lavish sweet 16 or do some of the other things that you may see other people in two-parent homes do without feeling guilty. How do you give yourself permission to be carried for and taken care of when you are the single mother who's responsible for taking care of everything else. That is so hard. And I think that's why having, that's where having a strong sister circle comes in. And I hope that you have one. And I hope that single mothers have one. Um, So, you know, part of that is being able to take time for yourself. And I know for single mothers that, you're you're right, you feel even more guilty. Um, And I think sometimes it means shutting off some of the outside input that you get. I mean, we live in a very materialistic society. Mm -hmm. We just do. Mm -hmm. So it's easy to think that in order for kids to be happy and in order for them to be well-raised, they need lots of stuff. Um, But they don't. But it's easy to think that if you spend a lot of time watching TV and reading certain magazines. And so I think part of it is making sure that you're getting healthy inputs and your kids get healthy inputs so that you can focus on the things that are most important. And then it's, you know, like I had, having, having some friends that you can go to and say, you know, girl, I just, I really wish I could get, you know, my daughter this and I can't and some people you can commiserate with and talk to and people who can talk you down and say, it's okay, it's okay, I understand how you're feeling, get it out, or go to a therapist. We don't do that enough. You know, we tend to, um, you know, if we're sick, some of us will go to the doctor, we'll take care of our bodies, but we won't take care of our minds. And sometimes I think all of us need a mental checkup and being a single parent is so, so hard, and you carry so, so much on your own. And I think probably, you, I mean, you, you need it. It's something that you need to just help you and make sure you're okay. Mm-hmm. Very, very good. Um, this is Idea, this is Waikiti. Do you have any other questions? No, ma'am. I mean, this is oh, a lot okay. to ponder. Yeah, I don't have any questions. Do we have any questions from the audience? If you do, you can uh, text at 504-650-0656, and we'll take maybe one question from the audience. There's a lot of people on tonight, but if you had a question for Mrs. Harris, if you can text 504-650-0656, and we will um, unmute you. If we don't get a text within the next, uh, two minutes, we'll go ahead and end because it is getting close to that time. However, I would just like to oh. say in closing, um, uh, Mrs. Harris, I am absolutely, absolutely grateful for you being on this call. This was an absolute blessing to so many women. We would love to have you on because as you were talking, the importance and the weightiness of what you were saying as we're texting back and we're checking on on our social media, there are so many people who have 
the same feelings, who this will resonate with, and who really needed to hear your your opening. I promise you, every black woman needed to hear that it is okay and we will be all right. And to give ourselves permission to be our authentic selves and where we are at this moment, that it is absolutely okay to not have everything together. It is absolutely okay to stand in that truth and say, I need help. And if you can come on sometime really, really soon um, and just do a part two, but even just a repeat of everything that you said (laughs) in the very beginning again, I promise you because it was absolutely (laughs) heavy. It was absolutely weighty, and it would be life-changing to so many women that I know. The list is just going in my head, just rolling down names, starting with myself first and my mother and my sisters and my grandmother. And every black woman needed to hear that because we've just been placed, that burden has been placed on us for far too long that we have to be a strong black woman, that if you're a and weak black woman, then you're not a black woman at all, almost. Right. Because, you know, <laughs> that it's synonymous with being strong. And we're killing ourselves physically, mentally, spiritually. We're killing ourselves. We're overburdening ourselves. So just thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. I didn't get a response. You know, um, you know what? May, so you can go ahead. May I, oh, I was going to say, may I add something? Because I think you made a good point in talking about your mother. Um, And one thing I forgot to say, and that's as, you know, as black women, we have this long history of all of these four mothers who are amazing, who worked so, so hard. And when you look back Mm -hmm. at their lives, you can't imagine how, you know, those of us today have any right to complain. You know, one of the women in my book talked about how, you know, her grandmother raised like 11 children on a small farm in the middle of Texas somewhere and, you know, in the, you know, depression and, and, and half of her children went on to college. And, and so she's like, who, who am I, you know, to complain about anything? And so I think sometimes looking back at our mothers and our grandmothers somehow becomes their strength even becomes a burden. Because we think we have no right in this modern age when things are a little better, and in some cases a lot better. But that's not true. And one elder stood up at one of my um, a, a, a stop that I made in Atlanta, and I was talking at a bookstore, and she said, that's absolutely ridiculous. She's like, I can't imagine. I think she was in her 80s. She's like, don't not take care of yourself because some of some idea of some strength that women my age had or women older than me had. We would have loved to have had some of the support that you women have today. So don't use us as excuses not to take care of yourself. If, you know, your great-great-grandmother would have been able to sit down for a moment, if she had even had the choice, she would have loved that choice. So that's one thing that she said, to be sure that you do. Don't use, you know, your, your foremothers and ancestors as a reason not to take care of yourself. Excellent. 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 Um, Sister Waikiti, did you get any questions? No, I did not. So we'll go okay. ahead and close but, because it is okay. uh, approaching the yeah. 8.30 time, and we want to be very, very prompt and respectful. Please remember that every queen call is the last Thursday of every month, so please mark it in your calendars. Please take this time out for yourself to get on mute if you're at work or to listen to the recorded calls or pass on the information for the recorded calls. Always remember that a nation can rise no higher than its woman. When you teach a man, you teach an individual, but when you teach a woman, you teach a nation. Speak with you soon, queen. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.